You're You're listening listening to BQN. Assimilate the audio. Welcome listeners and viewers to What's the Tea Bab, a Star Trek Universe podcast here on the BQN. I'm your host, Christos Generis. And we are back after a two-week hiatus of me having a lot to do with my career and work stuff going on. We are back and just in time to cover all of your New York Comic Con star trek coverage Um, a big thank you for the feedback on our first few episodes i can't get over how overwhelmingly positive the feedback has been so thank you thank you thank you uh keep it coming um and a big shout out to kelvin wood for our previous episode uh if you haven't had a chance to listen to it or watch it yet you can catch that there in the episode backlog remember you can watch what's the tbev on our youtube channel of the same name or listen wherever you get your bq and podcast be sure to like listen, subscribe, leave comments, all that good stuff that only helps the podcast get bigger and bigger and bigger. If you'd like to help keep our shows coming to you each week, you can become a patron of the network on Patreon. Join the hive to enjoy It's Green, Amy's Math Moments, and other network perks. With a monthly subscription of $5 or more, you can join our meetings of the hive mind on the second Saturday of each month. Visit patreon.com forward slash bqn to get all the details and watch your messages. I'm going to jump right into this week's guest, um, a good friend of mine who I discovered I've known for at least five years now. um, And he is now the host of Trexpert Quiz Podcast. I'd like to introduce Mr. Davey Willett. Well, hello there, Christos. How are we today? I'm great. How are you? I'm really, really good, and I'm very excited to be finding out what exactly is the tea. <laughs> I love it. Well, the tea is whatever we decide it is, so that's a good thing. So, um, so, so for those of you listening, I'm sharing some pictures of Mr. Davy, if not Mr. Orion Davy. <laughs> uh, as I, I believe the first time I met you, I am in this blue shirt. I did not know who you were, but I was like. Oh my God, there's a gaggle of gays and they're all dressed as Orions and I have to get my picture taken with them. Uh, and that is, you that know, picture. what is really, really funny about that is you know, the amount of people that I had whole conversations with either at like, so this is all at STLB, by the way, you know, I was at masquerade bar, like painted as the Orion or just on the, the con floor who I would then see the next day after I had removed all the all the paint and all the makeup, and I'd walk up and talk to them, and they'd be like, "Who is this weirdo? <laughs> and why are you talking to me?" <laughs> right? <laughs> it's like like being a drag queen at a drag, right? Oh, and you know what? Like you know, uh, some of the others who are with me will will make jokes about the total transformation in personality I have once that paint is on, because I think. Drag queens will often tell you that, you know, you've got a bit of a shield, you're in a character, you can just completely let go. I was a maniac whilst I had that paint on. I just did completely uninhibited and it was uh, so much fun. And I haven't done it for a few years now. I really miss it. Uh, I kind of want to point out that episode, that picture of me in the blue shirt, that is my first day ever at a Star Trek convention. I, or not convention. STLV. I had done conventions when I was in high school and the early 90s and took a long break. And I believe that picture of me in the blue shirt is on my 40th birthday. And that was my like, I'm going to STLV for my 40th birthday. And so I met you on my 40th birthday. So like whether we realize it or not. Oh, no way. I think that now I don't remember, I don't remember taking that photo with you, but I think that was probably 2017, the second year that we did it. I mean, I, my recollection of meeting you at at STLV was at the masquerade bar. 
Um, you were sitting talking to a bunch of my friends and you were immediately when I sat down, you introduced yourself and you're like, oh, I've got this really, really cool um, Facebook group, the Federation. It's you, were, you should join all this kind of stuff. And I was like, okay, sure. <laughs> what else? Well, you met drunk Christos, you know, so he's always fun to meet too. It's a little bit like Marina Sirtis. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes. I think we'll be talking a little bit about, uh, <laughs> I mean, Marina Sirtis doesn't even have to be drunk to be having the effect oh. of, well, drunk drunk Marina Sirtis and sober Marina Sirtis, I'm sure are very much one and the same personality. Pretty much. All right. Well, we're going to do our getting to know you, and then we're going to jump into some some big Star Trek news to break today. Mm-hmm. So, um, so listeners, viewers, you should know the drill by now. We're going to jump into our seven key questions of getting to know our guests of the week. And I think that hopefully by the time we get through all seven questions, you're going to know a lot more about Mr. Davey here. Mr. Davey, what was your first contact with Star Trek? Well, I I can't exactly remember how old I was. Um, I I want to. I, I always kind of say it was probably around about the age of eight or nine, and I was in. I was in a store. So in Australia, there, there was these stores called like Crazy Prices and and Clint's Crazy Bargains. There were these, you know. Uh, like two dollar stores, like you know, nothing, nothing over two dollars kind of stores. I don't know what you'd, you'd call those in the states, uh, but we were we were wandering around in one of them, and there was a this big um, bin of um, you know, VHS cassettes, you know, really old movies that no one has ever heard of before. They were probably straight to video before straight to video was even a thing. But there was something caught my eye, and it was this classic episode of Star Trek and there was there was a few of them in there uh and I I picked one up and it was only like three dollars and it was shore leave from the original series now I I I picked this up and my I didn't realize at the time that my my mother grew up watching Star Trek and so she immediately encouraged me to get it um and so this was pretty I remember like looking at the front cover seeing the Enterprise and like what is that that looks amazing and I kind of had, I think I kind of knew what Star Trek was already, but hadn't really paid any attention to it. And so it was funnily enough, it was my mother who convinced me to to let her buy me this cassette um, to take home. Now, it was awful, awful quality. Like, (laughs) it was, I don't know. (laughs) I mean, Uh, these look like bootlegs. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure I contributed to some sort of, you know, illegal piracy ring <laughs> by purchasing it. But it was legally purchased in a store that had them for sale, um, right. and there was like ten of them, and they weren't in any kind of particular order because I went back and and continued to to buy them because I wanted more and more and more. Um, and, but this was the first one. I, would you believe that, like? Shore leave from season one of the original series is what was was my gateway drug into Star Trek. And you just got to look at the presentation of this. Like, why are they promoting the fact that Shirley Bon or Bonnie or whatever whatever it is was was in this episode? Because um, I went I know, and looked right? her up recently and she was in, in some sitcom on CBS or something around about the same time, which I don't think was any kind of runaway hit, but... Hey, she's in it, so buy this cassette. Uh, but look, I, I was instantly just fascinated and, and drawn to the whole concept of it. And then, funnily enough, I found out that there was a more modern version of it on TV at the same time, which was The Next Generation, which I think was in its third or fourth season. Well, in its third or fourth season on Australian television. Um and on Australian television, it was put on at 10.30 at night on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And it was because it was they could put it on like Australian network television could put it on at that time of night and people would watch it. Uh, and my yeah. mother used to stay up and record it on, on VHS for me. Um, there you go. And then I would get up super early and, and watch it before before I went to uh, school. The next Aww. Day. 
yeah so my, my gateway was these it was it was these these cassettes i had about four or five of them and i watched them over and over and over again despite their terrible quality but they just captured my imagination somehow all right let's get to the, let's get to more like some fun stuff here um what is your favorite star trek series now that we've got like a thousand of them you know what 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 is your favorite as of today all right so i mean if in the modern trek era n- nothing has delighted me more than strange new worlds and lower decks i'm, I'm willing to bet that's a pretty popular answer at the moment like uh, they, they've become like they've become my background shows much like some of the modern era sorry the original era stuff um from the 90s was so i've strange new worlds i think i watched each episode about three or four times when it was on and lower decks i've always got running in the background whilst i'm cooking dinner like i just think that lower decks is so clever and so funny and what I love about its impact on the fandom is that sometimes it's so clever that the joke just goes way over the fans' heads and it takes them a while to cut a few rewatches to yeah, come right? back and get it. <laughs> I know exactly what you mean. I, I can watch an episode three or four times and continue to pick up things I miss. Even after watching like some of the episode breakdowns that are out there on YouTube, I'll, I'll watch those and I'll still like watch it Miss that, miss that, miss that. So, yeah, I love Lower Decks. Oh, yeah. it, look, it, it's made for for people like you and me, Christos, who, who, who grew up watching Star Trek in the 90s because right. I think like you, you, you know, the the series that always has my heart is TNG. Um, you know, it was, whilst surely even all that was, was my first contact, I fell in love with The Next Generation. Um, I, you know, finding... Because, like I said, it was it was not they did not broadcast it well on TV in Australia. So, but however, video stores would get the cassettes, and I would go and hire those out. So I'd be watching random episodes. So I remember one of the first episodes I watched was the Best of Both Worlds in its cinematic, you know, two part presentation without the bridge in the middle. Like, <laughs> and I was like, this is probably the best thing ever. Yeah. Um, yeah, and a, wow. a, a close a close second in '90s era is, is is Deep Space Nine for me as well. All right, I think it's very very much aligned with my story there. Yeah, mm. um, yeah, I, I was fortunate enough to being here in America that I caught TNG pretty much from the beginning, and I don't know how they were doing it, but it was even on after school toward the end oh, really? of the first season, and you know that's you only need about four or five weeks to get through season one. So Monday through Friday. So, but I was watching that after from like four to 5 PM uh, after school and I loved it, loved it, loved it. Um, All right. So TNG is your favorite series. What is your favorite all time episode? Oh, God, I really did not prepare for this. Like, I mean, I think it's an it's easy perfect. answer to say best. <laughs> I think it's an easy answer to say, look, best of both worlds, because it's one of the first episodes I ever really remember watching. I, I, I'm not ashamed to say that I was a big fan of Q episodes. Um, I used to love Q episodes because there was something I really enjoyed about uh, just the, the silliness of it. The fact that this, that, the this show I loved all of a sudden for an episode would become really silly, quite funny. Um, I think one of the first Q episodes I ever saw was I think it's Cupid, uh, which was the third okay. season one where he loses his powers. And I was just remember thinking that that was just you know John Delancey was always so hysterically funny in that role. His comedic timing was was always perfect. Not to say that they're, they're my all time favorite, but for some reason the, the Q episodes hold a very very special place in my heart. Um, one episode, and, and, and you asked for my one all time favorite. I'm wondering if everyone ever gives you like a single answer to this question. I mean, um, I can't give you one either. So, I mean, it's, it's yeah. kind of go ahead. Something that, something that I was actually, I've actually really been thinking about. So, in, in our first episode of Trexperts, we did it all on quizzed everyone on pilot episodes. Right. And, I did a lot of like talking to people on social media, like, what's your favorite? What's your favorite? And everyone said emissary. 
and I've and I've realized like emissary is a really really good episode like it the is. production value is high the introduction to the characters is really really good and then I I had a realization myself that every time I go back and rewatch DS9 unlike other shows I don't skip emissary like I will rarely watch encounter at far point if I'm going back and watching TNG caretaker I can take or leave um, Enterprise doesn't get many rewatches these days, but Emissary is one that I will just put on because um, it's just, and again, because I love Best of Both Worlds, I remember when, again, when I saw that for the first time and it was the Battle of Wolf 359, finally getting to see that so many years later, mind blown. Yeah. Um, yeah, I loved how they were weaving Trek lore together, especially during those, year and a half where TNG and DS9 crossed over and mm. crossover episodes and crossover storylines like the Maquis. Mm. But yeah, um, to be able to see Wolf 3 of 9, which we knew about already three or four years later to watch it, like get to see the battle that we never saw. Yeah, and cool. it was done pretty well, especially given the, that it was not done with like cg or anything like that it was still a lot of you know model shots and and what have you and apparently that blew their budget for the whole first season um <laughs> for the most part. but it's still it's it's an exciting hour of, or you know hour and a half of, of television to watch for sure yeah have you had a chance to watch um any of the center seat which is like a 11 episode docu-series that uh, recently came out of no, you mentioned it. I think on either on this podcast or one of the other podcasts that you are, um, yeah. that you were a part of. Um, and I was actually, I was looking it up to try and find because I wanted to watch it because I thought it'd be good to find behind the scenes questions for oh, Trexperts. I feel like I'm ready for <laughs> Trexperts because of thinner seat because it really, but yeah. they they go really deep into even the pilot of DS9 and the in yeah. the DS9 episode so. You don't know what your topic is yet, so. <laughs> Bring it. I'm either going to do really well or, or fall flat on my face, but either way, if we're talking about Star Trek, I'm having a good time, so, you know. Yeah, and that's the whole so, point. That's the whole point, right? So what is your favorite Trek movie? Ooh, I think you're going to like the answer to this one. Um, oh, okay. it's, it's definitely six. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Ding, yeah, ding, under, ding. Under, uh, I mean... Uh, Undiscovered Country, I again, it was one of the first ones I remember watching. And I just, it was so exciting. Like it was, right. and, and you even go back and watch it now and it still just works on, on so yeah. it works as Star Trek. It works as science fiction. It works as an action movie, you know, character driven drama, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, similar Fast to, I think First Contact has that vibe too. But um, yeah, it was, it, it's just a good time. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. And we'll, we'll, we'll maybe tie to this a little bit later, but everything I'm getting from Star Trek Picard season three is for me is reminiscent of Undiscovered Country. So we'll see. Who's your favorite character? And I love this because I have no idea who your favorite character is. So mm. I'm going to learn just like anybody else. Look, fa favorite character, I think, changes as my life progresses. So if I was to tell you who my favorite character was as, I, as a kid, um, when I used to watch it, when I first started watching TNG, I actually used to really like Wesley <laughs> as a kid. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there's no, there's no need for that. I, no, no, hear me out. Hear me out. Um, <laughs> and, no and, judgment and here. No judgment here. <laughs> yeah. Um, when there was something about Wesley as the kid genius getting to be on the starship, getting to fly the starship, that eight year old me was just, it was more that I wanted to be him um than than anything else like i yeah. just there was something i had I, I 
I was I was a pretty dorky kid, um, you know, used to spend a lot of time playing, you know, by myself and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, there was, there was a lot I loved about about Star Trek and how it kind of spoke to me. And I just I saw that this kid genius who, you know, just got to got to fly the starship and was respected by all the adults and well, for the most part, when they weren't telling him to shut up. Um, shut up, by the way. So, yeah, so look, I, I I absolutely you know really idolized him as as a kid, and I was kind of disappointed when when he left in the fourth season, and I used to really look forward to his little little guest star episodes, um, and I I can I remember being disappointed by how he was the the closure of his arc in the seventh season where he didn't become the next Starfleet prodigy where instead he sort of transcended and became a traveler. I mean, I've accepted it now, but at the time I was like, I, as my, one of my childhood favorites, I did not appreciate how they, what they did for my, one of my favorite characters in the end. Yeah. Because of your answer for question number five, I get to ask you number six, um, who is your favorite captain? So it's, it's fast becoming daddy Pike. Uh-huh. Now yeah, you you, you did have a photo of of my dog up on the screen earlier. Uh, yes, I did. And and you know Christos, but but your your listeners and your viewers may not know that um, I have a a fifteenth month old Cavalier King Charles Spaniel. There he is, my little boy, um, and that is Captain Pike, um, dressed up there for. So my work has a a pet of the month competition on our slack channels <laughs> and we had a sci-fi month when they had the for when they had the may the 5th uh, a few months ago and so that was that was pike dressed up for sci-fi month um but yes i when i when i got him i i wanted to um name i wanted to name him after a star trek character and Funnily enough, Strange New Worlds had not started at that point. I named him after Pike's performance in season two of Discovery, uh, which is brilliant. Because, which, which is which is brilliant. Like he bought exactly what that show was lacking in its first season was that you know good central leadership character that everyone else kind of you know rallied around and played off. And 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 look, Anson Mount. I mean, not only is he a, a handsome, handsome man. Uh, he just brings brings that character to life, um, and he's such a modern version of what good leadership should look like. Yes, right. he is a he is a white middle aged cisgendered male, uh, but he is Woke. so open and collaborative, and he used uh, correct pronouns when uh, Jesse James Keitel was on the show and all that kind of stuff. And I was. Uh, yeah, he's right. I think he's becoming a lot of people's favorite. There's there's a lot to love about Pike. Yeah, I think he's a great foil to a lot of what people are saying right now. Whereas, you know, if you're if you are a a cisgendered white male, straight white male, there's no mm. place for you in society. And I'm like, absolutely not. Here's a great example in pop culture of exactly what that could look like and 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 be accepted and be be heralded as a hero and and, and a leader that a, a a diverse crew looks up to so it, it's mm-hmm. it's been nothing short of amazing and i think paramount and cbs hit pay dirt with that uh season two of discovery and now Strange New Worlds. I got my 19-year-old nephew to start watching Strange New Worlds as an intro to Star Trek, and he loves it. So, Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, apart from the few little sort of discovery threads that are in there, um, it is it is a great modern sort of, you know, gateway into, into Star Trek. Probably, you know, for young people, probably even more so than, like, Prodigy. Is, right. <laughs> to be and honest. It, and I feel like, when it does throw back to discovery stuff, they do a pretty good job of showing flashbacks or giving some exposition to explain it. Final question before we start jumping into some some current events. Um, what does Star Trek mean to you? You know, when I, when I saw you send this question through, I, I really had to think long, long, long and hard about this. 
And I don't know if my answer will make a lot of sense, but I, I think it might speak to some people out there. Star Trek gets me. Now, growing up gay in a part of Australia where it was not easy to grow up gay, you know, being a little different in many ways, I never really, I, I struggled to find somewhere where I fit in as a young boy, a teenager, a young man. Um, sometimes there are still times when I, I still don't quite know where I fit in. But when Star Trek is on, no matter what series it is, even if it's the worst episode of Enterprise or the original series or whatever, everything just feels kind of right. Um, I don't know if it's the, you know, the, the beautiful vision of the, you know, the utopian future where humanity gets better, um, but there's something about it where it's it's my place and it's my home. Now, mm. I will fast forward that answer a little bit to my first visit to Star Trek Las Vegas, which was the 50th anniversary year in 2015. Uh, oh, no, 2016, sorry. Um, 2016. Now, I remember that, like, I was just like, yeah, this is going to be a once in a lifetime thing. And I'll try it. And I'll, I'll never forget the overwhelming sort of rush and elation and endorphin rush or whatever you want to call it that I had from spending that week, um, at the Rio surrounded by people who just love this thing as much as I do and who feel the same way about it as I do. And not only that, but I found I, I never, it, another part of this is that I have never really felt like I have a good fit in the gay community sometimes as well. Aww. And then all of a sudden I, and it's, it's, it can be hard to kind of find your, your niche in it, I guess, but uh, all, there were so many <laughs> gay Star Trek fans, especially gay men at yep. STLV. And I was like, there was just something about it. I'm like, this this is me. This is my place. These are my people. This is my tribe. Yes, um, finding your tribe. Star Trek, yeah, Star Trek gives me that. I've met people like you and, and Kelvin and, every and you know, I know every most other people on the BQN as well. Um, and you are all totally my people. Um, and it, it's, as I said, it, it, it gets me. You all get me. I all get you. And um, I all get right. you. Yeah. <laughs> Shall we talk about yesterday? <laughs> now, here is the real team, my friend. Yes, this is this is great. I, I mean, I love that this show has two distinct parts to it. The getting to know you and let's talk about what's going on. And boy, in fact, listeners, I'm going to preface this for you right now. Davey and I are only going to talk about the Star Trek Picard trailer and panel today. Um, because I feel like it's going to definitely fill up the rest of this podcast. Next mm -hmm. week, we will cover the Prodigy and Discovery trailers and those panels as well. So got all that business out of the way. So Star Trek Picard, first and foremost, let's talk about the actors being together yesterday. Um, I think most people saw either if you got to, if you got a chance to watch the panel um, which you can get now on YouTube, I believe you can watch it. Or if you had a digital ticket to NYCC, um, if not, you saw the pictures on Twitter, and it's the first time, at least not on screen, because obviously they filmed Picard season three, but it's the first time in public that the TNG cast has been together since STLB 2017 for the 30th anniversary, which I was there for actually. Mm -hmm. but uh, same but um what were your what were your thoughts davy at seeing everybody together yesterday look nothing <laughs> there's just something magical about this group together right now i haven't watched the whole panel i've only seen snippets of it but you know you talked about the the stlv uh 2017 panel when they're all together and it's just the same feeling like this is a group of people who they had this moment in time together where they were on this show, you know, essentially they worked together for seven years. Right. Um, 
and, and how many of us can say that we probably still have such close friendships uh, with people who we worked with years and years and years and years ago, like to the level that these people have. And there's something to be said about that in terms of just why this cast works so much, you know, because I was watching their, their Entertainment Weekly interview that they did after the panel uh, this morning and I think it was uh, Marina Sirtis actually said, do you know what, we actually like each other. Like we really <laughs> like each other. And then you just sit there. There is just so, and, and that comes through on the screen when you watch them all together. I, every I just smile ear to ear every time this group of wonderful humans are, are together. I just love them. Yes. Yeah, I I just got excited. Like, you know, you, you always see onesies, twosies, right? But seeing all seven of them together again, I I just got all the warm feels and exactly that. You, you watch their dynamic together and you're like, you're at a point where a lot of them, you know, they don't have to agree to do some of these things. They do it because they want to. And it definitely shines through. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And you you pick up on all the, the fun little personal dynamics that they have. There's, there's something I find fascinating about, you know, seeing the relationships between, you know, Star Trek cast members. Uh, especially, I just love how Marina just lays into Patrick <laughs> Stewart about being old. <laughs> Yeah, because I don't know if you've seen that Entertainment Weekly interview that they I just talked oh, yeah, about. Oh yeah, with the microphone flip. Yeah, oh. <laughs> he's, he's got his microphone upside down. Which I mean, <laughs> like, <laughs> at... <laughs> it's just because it's it's like it, it's like I don't know. It's it's the Patrick Stewart version of like calling your mum or your dad on Facetime and they hold the phone right up to their eyes, right? Or something <laughs> like that. And you're like, at the same time, he's Patrick Stewart, and we have mad respect for him, and but he is kind of like. You know, old grandpa now too, in some ways, where it's like, turn your microphone oh, yeah. right side up. You're, you know, but you know, when he does talk, I mean, he's oh, yeah. fun, and so the man has I, mellowed. The man yeah. has mellowed over the years. Like, yeah. yeah, he well, and I've seen interviews with him for like old Entertainment Tonight interviews and stuff from when Star Trek first started, and he admits it himself. He was he was a serious fella back then, you know, you know typical yeah. kind of man in his forties at the time, you know, everything very serious, no time for jokes, and you know they talk about what he was kind of like on on set at that time. And now, oh man, like just everything's everything's a joke. <laughs> like he's yeah. always he's just super silly, and I love it. It was funny, like the one thing um, I, I know you said you hadn't watched the panel, but one thing he did say yesterday was he was very open for another feature film of TNG. And and then Jonathan Frakes jumped on that bandwagon on Twitter. So I'm like, all right, are they campaigning for a feature film? And obviously they probably wouldn't even green light anything like that until they see how well mm -hmm. season three is re, uh, received. But um, what I thought that was kind of telling for them to say, Hey, we we filmed this ten episode, you know, going out with a bang, the the proper send off. But hey, you know what? Maybe we would keep going. So I I I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, I mean, it's is it, yeah. I feel like they're trying to give the fans more of of what they want, and I think they probably since Picard started, we've probably wanted to see season three a little bit. And you know, they there's been a lot of talk that season three will right all the wrongs of Nemesis and give it give these characters the send-off that they, you know, properly have deserved. I don't know if I would want to see another TNG film. And no. one thing I might like to see, though, is just a, a, fil a, a film, a Star Trek movie, but it's more kind of that that the Star Trek universe all in one film. I think they talked about doing this some time ago, where, I don't know, wouldn't it be great if we had maybe a film that wrapped up that whole Berman era where right. it had Voyager cast, DS9, TNG, like all three of them together um, in some way, shape or form, you know, to kind of tie yeah. all of it up. Well, that was what was supposed to come after Nemesis and yes. we never yeah. really got to see that. So, um, yeah. I mean, Nemesis definitely has its issues, unless you're Amy Nelson and who believes that's a great movie and 
just I mean, it's it's it's, it's an exciting movie. It's got it's, yeah. Well, the the action I'm, in it's done quite well. Well, and that's what they were trying to do. I mean, they hired this director who was literally there just to make an action movie. Um, which yeah. don't get me wrong, I love action in Star Trek, and I love spaceship battles and all that stuff, starship battles. Um, but I think Nemesis continued this trope that I think we're going to see righted in Picard season three of, you know, it being the Picard and Data show, and and it, to the detriment of the rest of our supporting cast. Um, so. And um, that's the one thing I liked about TNG is that it seemed like it was an ensemble. The movies definitely felt like it was Picard, Picard, uh, Picard, Data, Riker. And everybody else was just kind of there wherever they found a line for them. Yeah, I remember when Nemesis came out, I, I had I remember thinking, why are they trying to turn... The- this old man into an action star. Patrick Stewart is, right. is not an action hero. I mean, he was—he kind of did all right in First Contact, where he kind of like you know sh- stripped down to to fight the Borg Queen at the end. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, he was but everything never, down he, to the, the you know the Argo on the planet. Like, why are they on a no. four wheel like motor vehicle? Like, even it seems outdated now by today's standards. Yeah, I mean, it's like they tried to make him Kirk a little bit. You know, it, because it was a film and he was never Kirk. It was the whole point. Right. <laughs> All right. So we talked about the actors. We talked a little bit about the peripheral. So let's get down to the actual trailer and some of the things that we got to see in it. So, I mean, so what are your... <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I might need to get a glass of water. <laughs> He's talking about having cocktails before. I might need one of those before we dive into this. It was emotional. Uh, there was a lot, like, in a minute I and know. a half. It was. Um, and we got it exactly one month to the day from the Star Trek Day trailer. So it was, like, literally got trailer one or teaser trailer one, teaser trailer two. Um, and they're only calling that a teaser trailer, by the way. They're not calling it a full-blown trailer. Um, wow is probably the best. There's so much to unpack in this, so I'm glad we have a little time to do that. So um, first and foremost, I kind of want to address this little thing that's kind of going on on Twitter, and it got mentioned. So if you dial back to the first trailer when Picard and Riker are in the shuttlecraft and they're in the star base, they're pulling up and they're like, well, there she is. And then she a thing of beauty or something to that effect is what Riker says. Hello. And beautiful. It cuts. Yeah, there you go. Hello, beautiful. There you go. Yeah. That's why I don't do this alone. Um, <laughs> uh, and they jump onto the Titan and they're like, oh, well, they weren't looking at the Titan because that wasn't even Riker's Titan. Um, mm. And Terry with, they showed the Enterprise F yesterday, which we'll get to. And many people asked on Twitter, is that what they were really looking at was the Enterprise F? And Terry Metallic said, no. Mm-hmm. I think the answer is the, the, the recovered Enterprise D saucer section from Viridian, whatever planet from generations that it crashed on. I think it's been recovered and is now a museum. And it would have had to have been recovered because how the hell are we going to find Moriarty? So, <laughs> all right, we'll we'll get to Moriarty in a minute. Well, yeah, we're getting there, folks. There's a lot. Look, I, I, I've definitely heard, heard that theory a few times, and look, I'm I'm here for it. I think that would be a, a wonderful, like it doesn't need to be a big deal. Like even if it's just like it's a it's a shot of it, they fly underneath it. We get to see it. We know that the you know because I think so many of us love the Enterprise D so much, it would just be great to see it in, in modern Trek, even if even if for a few minutes. I think it'll be a, a yeah. wonderful, breathtaking moment for the final season of Picard, right? Like yes. to just have that, because it sounds like they're trying to really kind of weave in a lot of those real nostalgic threads into it, and this would be perfect for that. If, if anything, just as a tribute to Deanna Troy's piloting capabilities. <laughs> Don't shoot her from underneath. It's all scraped up. (laughs) (laughs) She's like, oh, yeah, I got this. I did my command training. I can fly the ship. (laughs) Yeah. I always like to throw it out there, too, though. Like, everyone loves to pick on Deanna for Nemesis and for Generations. But, like, I think Beverly says 
or it, it said somewhere, maybe I'm th- crossing deleted scenes, that nobody died in the crash landing of the D. So. Yeah, they never kind of really cover off whether many people died or not. I mean, it seemed like they, uh, you, you, didn't, you didn't see any of those horrific scenes of people getting stuck behind the, um, you know, the containment barriers in the drive section or anything like that. Um, I did always wonder why having they the, were having, having their back broken so, by a barrel. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I always wonder, and we're kind of, oh, man, it's a little off topic, but I, I've always wondered when they're doing that big evacuation scene. I know it's totally for dramatic effect, but if the drive section is meant to be all engineering and all that kind of stuff, why were there so many kids down there? Why? Right. Why were they having to... none. Well, <laughs> exactly. I mean, even the schools would have been in the saucer. Exactly, exactly. It's yeah. like, oh, no, we just want this emotional scene with the teddy bear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and apparently sick base is, is down in the drive section too. So I'm like, I never thought that until that, so. Yeah, yeah. All right. I mean, as I said in Lower Decks, you can do anything in a movie. <laughs> so kind of sticking with first and foremost, let's talk about sir, our ship porn that we get to Woo! see. Um, <laughs> do we ever, right? Um, Woo! <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Sorry. Off, I, just a, I just need a moment. <laughs> I liked the Titan A after the first trailer. I love it after mm-hmm. the second. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. and uh, so those of you who are listening, we got some graphics up of the, the Titan and the Enterprise F and, and Starbase and my next graphic has even more of the Titan. But um, yeah, it's a beautiful ship. And I didn't even realize that the saucer isn't a complete saucer. It not complete yeah, it's circle. Like it actually, it's yeah, it's more of a horseshoe. Um, and um, I'm, I'm here for it. That Those aerial shots, you know, I'll just jump right to it. We can, um, you can kind of see it down there in the bottom corner. Um, yeah, that aerial shot they show in the debris field or mm. I don't know what, what kind of nebula they're in. That, that's a whole other conversation to have there is they're having some sort of cat and mouse game. The Titan looks rather powered down in that one shot. Yeah, like it's that Neo Constitution vibe. Like I was not sold on that originally, uh, but now that I've seen it in action, and like you can you can see it in some of these close up shots you've you've got on for the video version at the moment. Like just. Yeah, because I just I, w- I just watched a um, uh, motion picture at IMAX yesterday, and I can see like all those some just gorgeous, not over the top, but gorgeous little throwbacks to to the Constitution, um, and it's just it's just beautiful, even to like little wow. like where the little phaser arrays are and and how the windows are. There was something about seeing it in action, which was just like, yep, no, nah, this is right. it. This is this is the future of Starfleet, and I love it. <laughs> right. The Constitution A, I will reiterate, is my favorite starship. And maybe that's a question that needs to get added to mm. what's the TV. What is your favorite starship? Oh, well, look, a, a very big fan of, of, of the Enterprise D for sure. You know, it okay. Was, oh, yeah, that's probably Enterprise my second. So. Yeah. And look, I'm a, I actually really, I, 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 I've got models of, of the Constitution refit and the original Constitution in my study. And uh, there's something I love about both of them. There's just something so wonderfully classic and, and beautiful about both of them. So I, I yeah. agree with you on the, on the Constitution refit for sure. I really enjoy the Strange New World version of the Enterprise because I feel like it's a little bit of a blend of the original and the refit. There's those mm. elements that are, it, it's kind of like taking in both of them kind of blending them together. If there was an intermediate stage, that would be it. Yeah. Yeah. Totally agree. Yeah. Um, one of the things I wanted to point out in the trailer, um, especially with this top image where the Titan is kind of making its way and it's being pursued by, well, they told us what ship the other ship was, but I forget already. Um, you can see that it's been hit and damage and it's got battle damage to the hull and it's the way the effect is is reacting it's very much like how the torpedoes were the torpedo damage in star trek 60 undiscover country was mm. the battle of Kittimer. and i love how they're bringing those same kind of throwbacks back to um to this show so it's pretty cool 
Yeah, I, I can imagine that we are going to have a season full of Easter eggs. I mean, the trailer alone was was exploding with them. Um, so right. I think if, if they're going to go, if they're going to go with this whole Neo Constitution thing, then yeah, we, we're going to get. There's going to be lots of little bits and pieces like that to look out for. I, I'm getting a, a right. love letter to to the Constitution kind of vibe from it. And um, I think we see a big starship gathering around space dock at Earth of mm. what looks to be hundreds of starships. And I can only think that it's for the inauguration flight of the Enterprise F. That's what I think was going on there. I don't know what you think about that, but pure speculation. I don't have any in, any inside information on that, but that's what I think. Yeah, was no, going no, on. You, 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 you could be right. Like, I wonder if we will get much of the Enterprise F apart from this little flyby of it. I don't know. Yeah. I, it's it's hard to say. Like, will we get to meet the new crew, the new captain? I mean, that could be a risky thing to do in case they, you know, get fan pressure to make a series about it. Um, yeah. I, I do like that. So I was never a Star Trek online player, but I, I understand that this is... A, based off a design that someone had for the Enterprise F in Star Trek Online. So I think correct. there are a lot of devoted fans of, of that game, which has been running forever, um, who will feel very validated to know that you know, some of the their creations in, in that universe are, are being made canon. So I think that's a really, really, really lovely thing to do uh, because um, I think you know, some of the new Trekkers has, has certainly copped some criticism for taking some stuff that may have already been done in, uh, in in different forms, whether it be, you know, books or video games or whatever, and just deciding to completely redo it. Um, right. So it, it's it's nice. It's a, it's a She's a good-looking girl. I like her. <laughs> yeah, that's, that is an Odyssey-class starship. And Odyssey, that's right. Yes, it has, it has existed since 2011 in Star Trek Online. And the mm. first time we saw it was in the... Uh, there is a comic book series that introduced the Picard series before season one and the Verity with Admiral Picard's starship, which was an Odyssey class starship. And um, I think what some people had pointed out was that recently in Star Trek Online, the bridge of the Enterprise F or the also the Odyssey class starship bridges have been changed. And some speculate that that is to be matching up with the bridge of the Enterprise F that we may see in season three. Love the look of the new space dock, though. That's yes. cool. That's, I mean, it's a yeah. it's a great throwback to you know the 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 model that we all know and love from the movies in TNG. But you know, it's natural to think that it would kind of evolve over time. Uh, I've always actually loved that that space dock model. Yeah. That, it, it's, it's always been pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 you know huge, big. You know, pro the the scope of the fact that it's probably this massive city just floating in the sky all on its own is is pretty cool. Yeah, I agree. It's it's beautiful. Um, I think one thing they did say that this is an all new space dock. It is not a build out of the original or an expansion. Mm. All right. So we'll start jumping into some of what we're seeing with our characters. So I think first and foremost, we see, well, I'll talk about Beverly Crusher, I guess, and you can tell me what you think. So should I leave? I got, <laughs> no. <laughs> should I leave I Beverly it. alone for, for this next segment? <laughs> hey, Team Beverly is alive and well, and I am noticing more and more and more Crusher love on, on Twitter. In fact, there's a, a Crusher Convo Twitter feed out there that I believe got together about an hour ago today to talk about a Beverly episode. And I was like, oh, I'm going to miss that because I'm doing this. But, you know, I'm, I'm doing Trek, so I'm good no, no matter what. But oh, I'm like, yeah, yeah. there's some she, Crusher she, love out there big time. And so I think, um, you know, we see Beverly kind of hiding in the beginning of the first trailer and the, the distress call. I mean, there could be like Beverly hid in stasis and then Picard finds her. But the look on Picard's face when he sees that that's Beverly in stasis, I mean, mm. he looks heartbroken. I mean, like, like that's just tying at all the heartstrings for him. And the complication of seeing Beverly 
for the first time in what looks like it's going to have been many years. Um, I think that's going to be pretty, pretty impactful um, for him. And I think it's going to be a very impactful moment in the story when we finally do get to see it. Yeah. I mean, you've, you've always got to wonder when you watch a trailer, like uh, what segment, what's part of the series and in what order are you seeing things? I feel that there is a, a, there's obviously a distress call from Beverly, which I think is going to be some form of catalyst for our plot for season three. Like that is going to be right. whatever it is that, that that's potentially what's going to sort of get Picard out and get the gang back together or whatever it might be. That, that, that's my feeling on it anyway. So I mean, obviously, at some point, he he's going to find her. But like, is is the first time he finds her when we see her in stasis here, or when they're having the conversation here when she's like, "It's going to be attempts on your life, like it always is." Um, oh, I got it, I got thoughts on what that is. Okay, okay, I think I think this I think that's about their relationship, and like I think he's, they're literally talking about why they're not together, and I think she's mm. saying, "I can't deal with your constant." You know, you're always in danger. You always have been. It's like mm. constant attempts on your life. You know, that was why we never got together all those years before. I, I mean, I could be wrong, and Lord knows it won't be the first time. But well, on the other hand, I think that the down context before. of that. <laughs> what's that? She's turned him down before. She's, <laughs> she's always admitted to you know that the feelings are certainly mutual, but she's. Uh, whether it goes back to what happened with Jack or whatever, she is always gotten close, but she's always been the one to go, no, ma'am. Nope. I, and I think that's part of it there. It's like, she's like, why, you know, we can't do this because, you know, you're, mm. you're always in danger. Well, you know, I can never, you know, and, and as somebody, like, if you think about it, she was married to somebody in Starfleet and lost him. Mm -hmm. And so she knows the risk and the danger that comes with that. And mm -hmm. so, of course, she's guarded about it because she's been through it before and she doesn't want to do it again. But mm -hmm. um looks like she's in, it looks like she's in sick bay here, by the way, um, in the scene. It looks like that's yeah. a, it There's some very sick. sort of Voyager-esque looking kind of wall panels in, in the background there. Of, I mean, it's, you know, it's meant to be roughly the same era. I mean, not roughly, yeah. it's a few years, quite a couple of decades later, I guess. But um, yeah, and look, you know, look, Beverly's had, she's had a lot of lo loss. Like, you know, she's she had Jack, but, you know, her only son as well, like, may as well be dead if you want to think about it like he's yeah, transcended he's to these other planes of existence and apart from his very unusual cameo in in nemesis like he's never really to have been seen again yep and she lost ronin yeah that's right <laughs> oh poor ronin oh uh, <laughs> the lesser <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I think one thing, okay, moving, kind of moving on from Beverly, if we could ever do that, um, uh, <laughs> is what we didn't get in the first trailer, but we did get in the next trailer, which we just got yesterday was a lot more of a check-in with the rest of the crew. Mm. I mean, mm -hmm. we got like, like glimpses of them in the first one, but we got to see Jordy we get to see Worf and Riker and, and especially a lot of Worf, I think. And we even get to see Deanna have some lines. So I, I feel like this was more a bigger peek into everybody and not just, you know, Picard and, and Beverly, which is kind of what I got more out of the first, the first teaser. Yeah. And I think there was, there was some little hints about what we're going to see of, of some of the different characters and then how they've changed and evolved. I mean, putting aside Worf's, I'm a, I'm a pacifist now. I don't know on your, on your last screen, there's, there's something about um, Geordie's outfit in a lot of these screenshots. I know he's a Commodore now, but it right. looks like he is wearing an apron and he works at Starbucks. Like what is going on? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, is that an engineering, an engineering apron, or is that some sort of special Commodore jacket? Yeah. Well, I mean, obviously, he's obviously so, you know Command Gold, as he's you know not Command Gold. It's not, Command isn't gold. Why? Yeah, I don't even know why a Commodore has gold. I mean, unless things have changed well, in the twenty fifth century. And the funny thing but... is, he's wearing that gold, but then later he seems to be wearing a red jacket. So I don't mm. know. 
And we haven't really heard of Commodores since um since the original Commodore O. Commodore, Commodore, oh yeah, Commodore, oh yeah, but Picard's kind of book. Yeah, Commodores are back. Tell everyone about it. Yeah. Um, one thing I did like, if I can loop back to what I was saying about Worf before, though, and, and the pacifism. Um, first of all, there was hints of his old um, kind of it, it, him and Riker. Of all, Riker's always kind of enjoyed stirring him up a little bit, and that whole like we're all going to die, rolling his eyes. That I I kind of had throwbacks then to. Uh, when he shows up in first contact um, and Reich is like, you do remember how to fire phases, right? Which yeah. seems really inappropriate to be saying that in the middle of a Borg invasion, just to be cracking a yeah. joke, but it's or, just very reminiscent of, of that. Um, tough little I'm, ships. I'm super excited little. about it. <laughs> and um, I did notice as well that Worf, um, I think he's playing, I think he's going to have some kind of like mentor or stabilizing kind of force on Raffi because yes. there's a scene where she, they, they, they're on a planet together, looks like free cloud. And he's like, oh, I used to be just like her, so full of rage or something like that. So I, I'm wondering if, if, if there's going to be a bit of a, a, a mentor kind of relationship between Worf and Raffi, yeah. which I would love to see. Yeah, I think one thing that they've said is that the whole crew doesn't really come together till the end of the season. So you're going to have pieces of them running running around doing different things. And I think you're right. I think, you know, Rafi and maybe Riker are off with Worf, you know, on free cloud doing something. Mm -hmm. um, we do see La Serena is, is still around. We see it on Free Cloud, and we see a scene with Rafi on it. And some people have speculated that Troy's on La Serena. But... I was just about to say that. It looks like in that photo you've got up on the screen now. I and even in the trailer, I I thought when I watched it, I'm like, oh, she's yeah. on on La Serena. There's definitely a, I, there's a scene of someone with their back, and you can to to the camera, oh, and you can see all the, the yeah. La Serena lights. I'm not too sure yeah, who that, that is though. That's Rafi. That's Rafi. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think Troy's on the alien ship here um but you know whatever that is um mm. could be wrong you know one thing i will say as much time as we're spending speculating on these trailers to your point <laughs> earlier <laughs> we can think we know what's going on and then you know the producers are just sitting this stuff laughing at us because they're like you got no clue you got no clue yes well one thing we did get out of yesterday mm. was our introduction to our big daddy uh, Amanda Plummer as Batik. Mm, mysterious, mysterious. Yeah, I mean, I I don't have. Uh, I had to kind of really kind of look up who Amanda Plummer was, but yeah, I see the, the connections to Star Trek Six um, and uh, some other stuff that she's been in. But I look, I it, it's hard to say. I mean, this, what you saw in the trailer, you certainly saw someone who looks like a very angry baddie who had, you know, all those beautiful bad guy lines about the ashes of the Federation and, you know, there's all that wonderful, you know, ad, you know adversary for, that you kind of need in, in, a, in a Star Trek like this. Um, who she is and what she represents and who these little bird people are around her. Um, I, I thought they I were Gnosticans had... originally. <laughs> Gnosticans, oh God. Like, no, now I can no see them better more. now, and I'm like, oh, those are Gnosticans. Oh, God, please no. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, I, 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 I don't know if you've got something that's in your mind as a theory. I mean, they're clearly going to have some way to link this in, I think, because there's some kind of well, link she's... back to TNG because whoever this individual is has been severely impacted by something that Picard has done that we, the viewer, have probably already seen. So it's going to be retconned somehow. But I have no idea. I I can't even uh, think. So whatever what about it, you? Whatever it is, it better be delicious. I agree that this is somebody we obviously we, we have not seen. But they're like, yeah. it's a new old character. So I feel like it is going to be a throwback to one of a TNG episode or movie where, you know, you know, we think it was all good and we left and it was like, oh, yeah, we made a mess. So it's kind of like, you know, second contact needed to clean that up and didn't happen. Mm. Um, <laughs> um, I do think it's really cool that she's Christopher Plummer's daughter who played mm. Chang, like, mm -hmm. you, like you said. 
Um, somebody pointed out to me that she's like the evil villainess in the Austin Power movies, and <laughs> that's going to be kind of hard to unsee in my head. But she has been described as a con-like character, and mm -hmm. I do feel like I see that. Like, oh, she yeah. definitely, there's definitely, I mean, there are some mad wrath vibes coming out of this whole thing with the 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 villainness and even like the the the, the cat and mouse and in the, the nebula or whatever the brief field that they're in um i feel like there's a lot that gives me in beverly's coat from the last trailer <laughs> um i don't know we'll see but um i feel like she's definitely somebody who's pissed off at jean luc and um mm -hmm. i hope that it makes sense why she's pissed off she's dr pulaski's daughter back for revenge <laughs> oh. <laughs> could there be could there be a pulaski tie come on give us if you want to give us real full closure let us know what happened to pulaski <laughs> She's suing Starfleet. <laughs> no, no. I just gave you a little tingle just then. You were like, <gasps> <laughs> Matthew Dempsey just had a little tingle. He still, oh yeah, in your first yeah. episode, he, he was a big. Yeah. I agree with him. I am a, I am a, I'm a Pulaski fan. Um, it's a he texted me the other day. A little yeah, shout out yeah. to Matthew. He texted me the other day, and he texted me a picture of uh, this uh, uh, collector you know, playing card that he got a Pulaski and it was autographed and he called it the Holy Grail. <laughs> Something back to him like, everybody's got to have scratch paper. <laughs> oh man. Go, when I you get back love to that, the, the dynamic between Picard and Pulaski was, was, was intense. Like I love is... like, Oh yeah. The child and um, unnatural selection. Like I said, I don't hate Pulaski. I just would rather have Crusher there. And I, oh, one yeah, thing we yeah. never got was like a Crusher and Pulaski team up, you know. And I say team up, not rivalry, because I mean, yeah, yeah. media loves to pit strong women against each other. No, give us, give us a team up, you know. Mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. it did, it did happen in a comic book that I have, but yeah. not so, in, yeah. not on screen. Yeah. Um, so I, I've just, I've just, I'm just calling it. This is Pulaski's revenge somehow. She's because they, they always just, they seem to not really not like each other. Like some of the stuff she, the card says, like he wakes up and he's just like, oh, this is something that that woman did. <laughs> they're, they're, they're those genetics from unnatural, un, the, the, you know, unnatural selection, the genetically modified children that were on that, uh, that planet that gave the disease yeah. yeah that's what she is she's one of those yeah 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 and look and all the and all the little bird mask people not little the giant bird mask people behind her they've all yeah. they look like muppets they look like, they look like old muppets <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure they'll be very menacing once we actually see them in action <laughs> for real for real uh well uh well more to more to come on our our villain this but um I mean, we're all here for it, right? Um, okay, well, Ooh, we yeah. had another... This, sorry, this was the last spoiler I was disappointed with. Um, and, I, I... And, and and listeners, if you're not watching, I, I just clicked up to an image of Brent Spiner as Lore. Uh, didn't we hear, like, Data, like, Jordy say Lore in another episode, yeah, yeah, yeah. like... <laughs> Yeah, in, it's the same way he says it in Descent Part One, where it's like, yeah. like, you know, yes again, <laughs> lore. <laughs> well, and it looks like, I mean, and and looking at this picture of Brent Spiner, you know, he's gotten human skin. So mm. whatever, like the Borg Queen was flirting around with there in First Contact with Data, either A, they've mastered that in, or B lore could be in like one of those golem bodies just like picard is when they transfer yeah. his consciousness over so that that's possible yeah like i there with everything they kind of explored with you know the evolution of sung type robots or sung type androids sorry um in the first season of picard i think there's there's plenty of reasonable plot explanations for him being back and being in this body whether he's mutilated some human and taken their skin or transplanted himself into a more a more modern android body. But 
Um, as, as a few people have pointed out I've in, in a couple of different YouTube videos and, and blogs and all that, still got the yellow eyes though. Yeah. Well, I think whatever they did, they found a much more comfortable way for Brett Spiner to portray the character without mm. having to be in a lot of makeup mm -hmm. or heavily CGI'd in post-production as well. Yeah. So, I mean, kudos. I'm, I'm just glad that if it's lore, I'm okay with that. I yeah. was not looking forward to another character for Brett Another Spiner. song. <laughs> yes. I, I think from the look on his face here, like lore has always been, you know, the evil, the evil twin, but there was always kind of a jovialness to him in terms of, you know, he was, but this, this time I think we're just going to see just plain old evil, angry, pissed off law who, who's here to destroy some enterprise D crew. <laughs> yeah. Or he's here to help them. I mean, like, what would be the biggest misdirect is if somehow they've mm -hmm. taken the piss and vinegar out of his veins and he's actually going to be, you know, <laughs> helpful. <laughs> well, yeah, that's, I mean, yeah, it could be and, a little, it could be a misdirect though, like they did with Peanut and then, Hamper and Lower Decks. <laughs> Beverly just comes up to him and create fixes a tick in his face like she does in Data Lore, you know, oh, ah, so all fixed. Ah, <laughs> wouldn't it be great now if, he if he's got Now he doesn't there. look eternally angry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like he's not angry that's just his face <laughs> born that way <laughs> <laughs> it's so we'll android it's to you to say that <laughs> yeah i think he's going to end up being helpful i don't want to say good I, but i'll say helpful yeah so. mm. time shall tell right our last big tidbit oh we are talked about moriarty which mm. i mean was the um LaForge daughters. Hi. We have two daughters and uh, both Mika Burton, who we've seen on Star Trek Day and in other Star mm -hmm. Trek uh events, and Ashley Sharp Chestnut, who we did actually see in action um in the trailer um uh, as mm -hmm. the ensign um at the helm. Um are playing Jordy LaForge's daughters and I think it's funny that the biggest thing that LeVar Burton has to say about the season is that he's happy that the redemption arc for Jordy being like this, like awful in love kind of creepy guy with no luck with women. Yeah. And he's, you know, a family man and married and has two very uh, bright, beautiful children who are in Starfleet. They're both ensign, so I think it was revealed yesterday. Yep, I was just thinking the same thing when when this uh, when you pulled this slide up, that it, how wonderful that Geordie became the family man, um, and I cannot actually get enough of Mika Burton. I thought that she was so good during those pandemic era Star Trek days. Uh, she was just such a, a fabulous host. I think she, I, I just wish she was still doing some of that Star Trek day hosting. Yeah. I love that. I think she was, when she was interviewing the Voyage crew and LeVar just pops in over her shoulder. It's so good. I know what I, you're talking about that. That was great. Yeah. And that, I remember that was, uh, that was what deep in, in 2020, deep in sort of, you know, real lockdown pandemic times. That whole day was just like a, uh, Breath of fresh air, just like our, our Federation mornings. That was just a, a wonderful day of Trek, which broke up a very monotonous period of time. So uh, to see to, the fact that she's now going to be a part of the Star Trek family as, as his on-screen daughter, um, just so excited. Yes, uh, I'm looking forward to it. I think um, what little bit we've seen here is is all very positive. And mm. I, I'm, I'm glad to be seeing kind of the, the next generation of the next generation. Um, being brought in um, to, you know, who knows where, what the future of Trek is. Um, so that this introduction of some new characters might be very cool. Um, totally agree. All right. I think that was what we had on slides for Picard season three trailer. Um, any final thoughts on the trailer? These days I try to manage my excitement, especially around, around trailers and, and, and what have you, because you know, obviously they're trying to excite us, you know, as you kind of alluded to this a little bit earlier. 
and it's worked. <laughs> it's worked. <laughs> I'm so excited. We are I was so bought in. Really deep and meaningful just then. But no, Paramount, you got me. I'm excited. You, Even though I feel like you spoiled a few things for me, I still want to know how all of this is going to fit together. Um, I... I think on a personal level, this has given me hope that this will be the Picard season I think we've all wanted to see. Um, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that it will go out on a high. I will try to manage my enthusiasm a little bit in that regards. But um, there's, I think we've all kind of wanted to see a little bit more of 24 20 or 25th century Federation. Um, and, and this trailer gives me a feeling that we might finally get to see a little bit more of, of what we were kind of hoping Picard might actually be. Right. Yeah. I, 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 I don't think you could have said that better. Um, I liked season one of Picard. Could it have been better? Yes. Did mm. I like season two more? Yes. Could it have been mm. better? Yes. <laughs> and now we have season three, which I think is looking like they're going for a grand slam. And my hopes are there. I mean, February 16th can't come fast enough, which like for me to be saying, hey, let's skip the whole holiday season. I need to get to February. Um, that sounds kind of weird to be saying that. But um, yeah, it can't come soon enough. And um, they're definitely setting the bar high including mm. um you know the, the teases the trailers terry metallis and and the likes of on twitter with all the hype the actors especially jonathan frakes and gates mcfadden have done a lot to try to hype up the season the rest have been more more silent um yeah i i'm all there and as a beverly crusher fan the way this season keeps on being portrayed as the stars of the season are Picard, Crusher, and Riker. Uh, mm. That's been said a lot recently. That is amazing to this Beverly Crusher fan. Um, and um, and I feel like it's, you know, if, you know, four years ago or whatever it was when we were at STLB in 2018 and they announced this Picard show, for me, just the glimmer that maybe Beverly Crusher would come back even for a cameo was enough for me to hold hope mm -hmm. to see that she's kind of being the catalyst in the lead for a whole season is uh, like far more than I could ever have asked for. So I feel like it's just like this thing, this ride that we're going to be going on that I just kind of want to like savior every moment of it because it's exactly what this you know 10 year old gay boy who identified <laughs> and loved beverly crusher yeah. from from season one um to see her kind of getting you know for everything that they did right for the character they did some wrongs and so for them to be coming back to like do her right i'm thrilled so yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm 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 optimistically excited and i just you know i trust in terry metallis and what he's saying yeah, and look, and, and Gates McFadden has said it herself, I think, that this is uh, one of the best story that she believes that the character has ever... I, I, I might not be uh, representing that correctly, but she's very excited that there's a lot of, like, wrongs that are being done right in the way right. that the, the character is being written and treated this season because yeah. she's certainly... I mean, you know, the reason why she left in season two, right, there's I mean, certainly been some mistreatment of, of, of her as, as, a, as an actor and, and Beverly as a character... Um, and as a strong female character in the series over time. So I think, yeah, we're definitely, they're, they're definitely trying to put everything back where it should be. <laughs> right. Yes. I think it, it's a nice bow they're trying to put on these seven characters. All right. Um, I'm going to ask you my, my uh, kind of back to our, our, our questions earlier. I had a final question for you. If oh, yeah. you could create the next Trek series, what would it be? So what's, what's gonna what would you like to see happen? Picard's, you know, by by May, Picard will be done. Yeah. What would you like to take its place? Do you know what I was? I was actually thinking before you even asked me. I was thinking about this this morning whilst I was out walking Pike because Picard's about to be done. 
I think Discovery probably only has a year or two left in it as well. Um, and I was like, and then, you know, we'll be left with, we'll have Strange New Worlds on, which is wonderful. And, you know, Lower Decks will pr probably still be going strong. But um, do you know what? We need something, well, I, I feel we need something a little bit more original and something that's not based off existing characters set midpoint in the timeline. Um, you know, I think a new ship in a future state it can be in it can be you know a couple of decades past picard whatever it might be you know set it in a in a time of a, a future state of the federation that we don't know anything about and you know kind of do what the what strange new worlds is doing and, and take us back to good old fashioned exploration and exploring the the possibilities of of the universe and and the galaxy because that's been one of the things that you know if i think, think about what really captured me about star trek when i was a kid was just that amazement as to what was what was possible with with the human adventure throughout the universe so that that's it we need just give us be original you know i i think discovery yeah. tried to kind of do that a little bit by being a little bit different and they and, they, and again when they went forward in, into the future but um still so serialized and all that i just yeah time time for time for something new and to and to and to go boldly forward i agree i i think kind of pivoting on what you said i think it'd be great to see a series pick up in 2401 or 2402 whatever the year mm. is now and kind of go be the next generation in 2402 and yeah give us a give us a new ship give us a new crew Mm -hmm. um, if you if you feel the need to have the legacy here or there, I would love to see. You know, we talk about the the Seven and Rafi needing their own show, and you know whether mm -hmm. or not we're going to see Admiral Janeway. You know, and that's sounding more and more likely actually. Um, yeah. But you get but you fundamentally need to give us an eighty percent new show. I mean, you can mm -hmm. have a couple of legacy characters there to be, you know senior management so to speak or <laughs> the boss the admiral back at starfleet but ultimately we need a new crew on a new starship out in the galaxy seeking out new life and new civilizations and not having it be completely reliant on easter eggs and throwback to yep. what has come before yeah I, yep. I agree push forward yep and that like kind of like how i think with gene rodemary with tng he you know resisted uh any sort of like crossovers with you know there, there were some mentions with the original series but i think he even kind of resisted deforest kelly being in in the first episode because he just wanted it to stand on its own two feet so right. you know that's right i i think you you kind of paraphrase what i was saying there really well there give us give us the tng of of the modern era um yeah i, I would love i would love them to be bold and to and to try something like that and there's, like I said, plenty of ways to make connections to things that have happened before, but don't, oh, yeah. we don't need to rely on it. We don't need to rely on it. And I think we're ready. Yeah. I think we are ready. I mean, even characters like Elnor, I mean, I don't think we're done with Elnor. We barely got to know him. Aww, you know, I would, such you know, he is a cutie. <laughs> uh, yeah. Really nice guy too. Um, mm. but yes, he's adorable. And I'd love to see him maybe on that ship he's at starfleet academy now right let's maybe put yeah, him as a crew that could be your link yeah he's I mean, a little, science little officer or something or not science officer security chief or something yeah, like that on little, on board the voyager b <laughs> there we go yeah all right all right well, uh, so Davey, thank you very much for being our, our guest this week um i kind my of pleasure. contradicted my um kind of contradicted myself last week. I believe I had introduced Justin Parker to be the guest this week and he was unavailable and you were super available at a last minute and perfect person to talk to for this particular week. So I'm very glad. Um, and I believe we can maybe uh, announce a little bit of a, a two week cheap crossover. What do you call it a crossover? Oh, we could we could definitely call it a crossover crossover I mean, event like you know like ds9 yeah. tng days yes yeah, so, yeah well i mean um, as you mentioned at the beginning i've, I've started my own podcast um trek quiz 
Uh, and we've we've only done our only done one episode. I've never done a podcast before, but it was so much fun. Um, and so each week on Trek Experts, we get uh, two self-proclaimed Star Trek experts, and I'm going to pit them against each other in a bit of a, 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 a some cuts to the Death style battle. And uh, Christos, you're you're joining us for episode two as as one of one of two Trek Experts who are going to battle it out We're against. Uh, against Kelvin, who was uh, a guest on an earlier episode of yours as well. Yeah, so listeners, you've heard, you've, you've met Kelvin on the previous episode three, and you're going to see him again on Trek Spurts with myself. And I have no idea how we're going to do, by the way. I'm either going to do all, but I listened to your first episode, which listeners, it's out there already, um, Trek Spurts quiz, go get episode one and listen. There were some hard questions in there, like... <sighs> Yeah, I was another one. I'm like, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, that's what I was kind of hoping for is that we would get that. You know, people listening along would be screaming the answer out, even to some of the harder ones. But oh, Christos, I was I was writing your questions last night. Your your topic is so random, <laughs> but it's um, I I think you two are gonna are gonna have some fun. I'm going to like not comment at all because you're in a position to go make changes. So, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> all, right. all right, let's see here. We would love to hear your thought on today's episode and hope that you'll join our Facebook group, the BQN Collective, to continue our discussion there. You can also tweet your thoughts to at what's the TBEV. We would love for you to reach out. We love interaction. Please join. Please follow the network on Twitter and Instagram at, at BQN Podcast. Don't forget all of our other great shows here on BQN, like Galaxy Class, All Good Things, which I'm a regular on as well with Mark White and Amy Nelson, Union Federation, Infinite Diversity, Mickey's Marvels, and one of my favorites, History with the Zalagis. So, Mr. Davey, where can people find you? when you're not putting people in cryostasis hmm. well when i'm not doing that which i do regularly by the way um so you look you can follow the show uh we have a, a facebook group an instagram and a twitter probably more active on the instagram and the facebook group um, which is just Trexperts quiz uh, and you can certainly find find us uh, our podcast on uh, any of the platforms that you get podcasts from, uh, and you can also follow me personally on Instagram at Dingo Dave eighty four. Awesome. You can find me at, at Greek Geek SD on Instagram and Twitter, as well as at What's the TBEV on Instagram and Twitter as well. At this time, we would like to thank our associate producer. Oh, look, it's Davey Willett. Thank you, oh. Mr. Associate Producer. <laughs> You're welcome, <laughs> listeners. You're welcome, Christos. I give you this beautiful gift. <laughs> and and that didn't that is not the reason you're our guest this week. But um, no, 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 no nepotism here. <laughs> no nepotism. But um, um, if you'd like to contribute, though, you can join on the Patreon. Um, it, it, it's I was very touched that you actually came out and, and and sponsored the show that way. That was very sweet of you. Oh, well, it's and I, I'm glad I did because I when I, I thought this was fantastic. It was, and to be quite honest, you starting this show is what inspired me to uh, to start my own. Um, I've been listening yeah. to all of you on the BQN for a while. I'm also a associate producer for Galaxy Class, um, and yeah. I, when you invited me on, I, I got excited about it. And then I started literally that same day I was walking to the gym and I was like, what would I do if I was going to do a Star Trek podcast? And yeah. It's Trek's funny. I start, fun. I started mine because I always felt like as much as I love to listen to other Trek podcasts and I listen to a lot, I mm. always felt like my voice wasn't being captured completely. Like, there's people who out here talk and they've got my eye. They, they, they're, they're thinking the way I think and they talk about things that I can agree with or not agree with. And But like I said, no, you know, I don't exactly hear my voice um, being advocated for and in this in this realm. And I was anxious to kind of jump in and have that voice. So kudos to you for doing the same. And and um I mean, major props for what you're doing because I know your show takes a lot of research and preparation. Uh, <laughs> it does, it does. But I'm, 
I've gotten I've gotten to a bit of a sweet spot spot with my prep where I've I've, I've got good planning for who's coming up and what the topics yeah. are going to be. Very much the guests usually drive inform what the topics are going to be. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's it's good fun and I'm I'm excited to to see it grow. Yeah. And I will say I'm looking at the time here as we're about to close out here, and I see that we have been recording for an hour and forty five minutes. And even when I go and chop out the blubs. It'll, at the most, it's going to get down to an hour and 40. So listeners, here's your very special double length episode with me. <laughs> and it's the best and of both worlds of what's the, the team, Ev. Exactly. Way the world out, you <laughs> Thank you so much for showing up, Commander Shelby. <laughs> <laughs> and once oh, again. We need to see more of her. I wonder if she'll make a comeback. Oh, yeah, Ooh, I, maybe she'll be here, here for that. Never see it. <laughs> this is why it's an hour and 45 minutes because you and I could just keep on talking. I know. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, listeners, hopefully you'll still be subscribed and listening after this episode. Thank you for listening again. And we hope you'll join next week for more tea on What's the Tea Bev? Farewell.